Dear students, welcome to the third class of financial accounting. In this class, we will be focusing on the principles, concepts and conventions of financial accounting. In the last two classes, we have understood the basic terminologies related to financial accounting. We also laid stress on what are transactions, what are events. We also focused on certain examples, certain terminologies which is related to financial accounting. Now in this class, our focus would be to understand the concepts, the conventions related to financial accounting. When we talk about concepts, conventions of financial accounting, they are nothing but they are good practices which have been given as a standard benchmark to be followed when you are making books of accounts. As we discussed in the earlier two classes also, that accounting has a standard format. You cannot make books of accounts in a random fashion manner. You have to prepare the books of accounts as per the protocols set, as per the standards and the rules and regulations which are of normal parallels. In this context, starting with our discussion of today's class, let us first of all understand that where do these principles, concepts and conventions come from. The first and foremost aspect that should be known to us in this relevance is that what is the meaning of the word gap. When I say the word gap, I mean to say that they are your generally accepted accounting principles. Now what are these generally accepted accounting principles? These accounting principles which are called as generally accepted accounting principles are the general set of rules regarding the recording of your accounting transactions. If you recall, we had discussed this step of recording in the accounting cycle in the previous classes. So when you are recording the tra accounting transactions, when you want to enter a data in the books of accounts, you have to refer to GAAP, that is generally accepted accounting principles. Then accounting as we know is not an exact science. So if it is not an exact science, the practices may differ from company to company and industry to industry. For example, a banking company will make its books of accounts as per its own protocol. An insurance company will make its books of accounts as per its own protocol. A manufacturing company will make its books of accounts as per its own protocol. So depending upon the nature of the industry also, these rules, these accepted principles may slightly vary and the standards have to be followed by each and every company in general. They are not rigid, they are not fixed, they can be customized as per the requirements of the companies. However, the standards set by the boards have to be followed in general. So that's an important concept when we begin to start the discussion of financial accounting recording of transactions. Further, accounting principles can also be said that they are nothing but they are good practices over a period of time. Like for example, if a company is preparing books of accounts, it has to follow a consistent method. It cannot do like this that last year it was following a methodology and it discontinues that methodology this year. So the companies have to be careful with the concepts, the conventions, the principles that they are following year on year for showing the right results to the investors and other stakeholders of the company. Further, GAAP is also lending objectivity and relevance to the accounting information. It means that if you want to make a comparison of this year results with the last year results, GAAP that is generally accepted accounting principle will help you to make a better comparison. The comparison would be on an objective basis and this comparison would have certain meaning if you are following these principles, these standards. When you follow these principles and these standards, certainly the output in the accounting books is going to be in a comparative form 
and it would be easier for you to compare the financial data from the relevant books of accounts. So, this is what we can say is the nature of generally accepted accounting principles. We will now move on to the concepts of financial accounting. To understand the financial accounting concepts, in these slides, in this discussion, you will see that we have given certain examples and we will be discussing them one by one. Before that, let us understand the concept and then we can relate it to certain case studies which are present in the slides. So, the first concept if we talk about when we are trying to make financial accounting books, we should always remember there is a concept called as separate entity concept. The separate entity concept is a concept which says that the owners are different from the managers of a business, meaning that there could be an investor who is sitting in Mumbai and there could be a manager who is managing the business from its Delhi office. So, the shareholder, the investor may be present in a different part of the country and the manager of the company may be present in a different part of the country. The owner and the management is different from each other, that is what is followed when we are making the books of accounts. It means that a company is a different identity and its investors are a different identity. For example, in this case, Star International UK has set up a captive BPO unit in India called as Star Trek India. It has invested 50 million pounds as capital in the Indian subsidiary. Do you think it will be recorded as a counting transaction? The answer to this would be that yes, Star International UK, the owner of the company and Star Tech India are two different entities. If the money is contributed by the owner to the company, the owner is different and the company is different. Hence, the books of accounting must record this as an accounting transaction and it will be shown as an investment in the books of the former and capital in the books of the later. This is what separate entity concept is which says that the owner will be different and the company will be different. Moving on to the next concept which is called as accounting period concept. When we talk about accounting period concept, accounting period means that there will be a time period of 12 months of time when you are evaluating the results of the company, when you are trying to see the financial position of the company, you will either follow a cycle of January to December or you will follow a cycle of April to March to analyze the results of a company. The accounting period would generally be a 12 months time period for any company. Let us see an example here. Hindustan Boiler Limited, an Indian subsidiary of a US company, is preparing its accounts using financial year as the accounting period. The US parent company prepares its accounts on calendar year basis. What kind of a problem will be there to US company and what would it face to the present consolidated results? Let us try to see the solution to this problem based on accounting period. As the holding and subsidiary company are following different accounting periods, it may not be possible to directly consolidate the accounts by the holding company. The Indian subsidiary will have to prepare two sets of accounts on the basis of financial year as well as calendar year for a local reporting of its result so that the reporting may be done by the holding company. To retreat here, a calendar year would be January to December and a financial year would be April to March. From this example, we have understood that the accounting period must be of 12 months, otherwise there will be troubles to report the results of the company. You will not be able to consolidate a result, for example, here because holding company is following a different cycle, subsidiary following a different cycle. So, it means that the consolidated results cannot be produced here. 
it is advisable that you follow a 12 months period either a calendar year or a financial year. This is what accounting period concept is. Moving on to the next concept which is called as money measurement concept. In our last two classes discussion, we have been continuously discussing that accounting transactions should be eligible to enter the books of accounts. Like we discussed earlier also in the previous two classes, we said that an accounting transaction will enter into the books of accounts only if it is measurable in terms of money. If it is not being measurable in terms of money, it would be difficult to show it in the books of accounts and if we cannot show it in the books of accounts, it will not have any meaning for us. This is what the money measurement concept also says. The money measurement concept says that if a transaction, if any to and fro exchange in the business is not measurable in terms of money, it will not be entered in the books of accounts. Only those transactions, only those exchanges which have been done for money will be going in the books of accounts and we call it as money measurement concept. Just to take an example here, there is a company called as Progressive Infotech which has earned a revenue of 1.5 million dollars from its exports of 320 million rupees in the domestic market during the month of July. Assuming the exchange rate at that time is 1 dollar which is equal to 45 rupees, what is the total revenue for the month of July? So, in this case, we will have to see that whether the transaction is measurable in terms of money and if it is measurable in terms of money, in terms of rupees, how much income, how much revenue will go to the books of accounts. Let us go to the solution of this case study. When we talk about money measurement concept, to ascertain the total revenue from the export of items done here, we will first of all be using an appropriate exchange rate which is given in the problem to us as 45 rupees for 1 dollar. So, the revenue from the exports will be recorded as 67.5 million rupees because we have converted 1.5 million dollar by multiplying it with the exchange rate of that time period which was 45 rupees. It means that it will result into a total revenue of 387.5 million means that domestic plus exports will be a total of 387.5 million rupees which will go to the books of accounts. So, this is what is money measurement concept. Moving to the next concept, this is called as going concern concept. The name itself suggests here that what would be the meaning of this concept. When we say going concern concept, going concern concept will mean that a business getting started today would assume that it will be running for a longer period of time. Meaning that any businessman who would like to start a business, any company which is being formed will be assumed to continue for a longer period of time. So, going concern means that the company will go on smoothly with its business operations that is called as going concern concept. It will not assume, it will not see that the company is getting closed immediately or maybe in a short period of time. It will assume that the company is going to work for an infinite period of time. That is what going concern concept is. Talking about an example for a going concern concept, there is healthcare pharmaceutical limited company which has got three plants which are located at Delhi, Mumbai and Pune. The company has decided to shut down the Pune plant and sell its assets either as a running unit or in a piecemeal manner. What will be the implication of such a transaction, such a decision in the books of accounts of this company? Do you think they should enter the books of accounts or do you think that it is being shut down and they should discontinue to put it in the books of accounts? As per the going concern concept, what should happen? What is the solution? In respect of Pune plant, the going concern assumption has been violated as the assets should be shown at their liquidated value. 
for other two plants going concern concept will hold good reason being whatever plant has been shut down will not be a going concern now the two leftover plants will be the going concern plants so that means the plants which are now running those two plants will follow going concern concept and the one which is being shut down will be following the against of going concern concept meaning that the concept here will be violated the plant which is shut down so this is what going concern concept is moving on to our next concept which is called as the cost concept now cost concept can also be precisely called as historical cost concept if you can recall in our previous classes we discussed that accounting will record the value of a particular item on original cost basis on historical cost basis it has nothing to do with the market value of the resources or of any particular item which is being evaluated and put into the books of accounts let's try to see an example of a cost concept here in this case industrial lab limited had bought a piece of land for 5 million rupees in the year 1970 so what is the original cost here for buying a land it is rupees 5 million and it was purchased in 1970 now the company has used this land to set up an industrial unit the current market price of this land is 20 rupees million so in terms of million the value is 20 million rupees now you can see that in 1970 the value of this land was 5 million in now in today's date if we see the value is 20 million so which one do you think should be going to the books of accounts to make an evaluation to do an analysis and at what value this asset should be shown in the financial statements of the company let's try to see the solution of this case now when we talk about the land which had to appear in the books of accounts here in this case the land will continue to appear at its historical cost which was 5 million rupees irrespective of the current market price which is following the cost concept in this case so this is what historical cost concept is where you will record the value of the asset at a historical cost at an original cost irrespective of its market value moving on to the next concept which is called as matching concept now when we talk about matching concept this concept has an essence in accounting language accounting language is a two fold aspect if you are earning you will have certain expense behind it isn't it if you are doing a sale you must have done certain cost behind it you will not generate revenue without expense can you so if you cannot generate revenue without expense to calculate your profits or losses made in the accounting in the transactions you will have to follow a concept called as matching concept what does the matching concept say matching concept says that your revenues will always be matched with your expenses to find out whether you made a profit or a loss Let's try to understand this matching concept with an example here. During the year 2010 to 11, Smart Trading Limited had bought goods worth rupees 13 lakh 50 thousand. It also had goods worth rupees 2 lakh, which were bought in the year 2009 to 10. So you see there is a difference between the data of 2010 and 11 and 2009 and 10. something which you have purchased in 2010 to 11 will be your current year's purchase something which is being carried forward from 2009 to 10 will be your previous balance from the previous financial year now at the end of 2010 to 11 goods costing rupees 4 lakh 50000 remain unsold what does it mean towards the end of 2010 to 11 goods worth 4 lakh 50000 are still unsold meaning that they are still in your stock so this is also referred to as closing stock 
something which you have brought from the previous year like 2 lakh rupees here is called as opening stock something which you were not able to sell off this year like 4 lakh 50 thousand in this example is called as your closing stock something which you have purchased during the year like 13 lakh 50 thousand will be a part of your cost for which you are making the goods to be sold now the remaining goods which have been sold during the year have been for rupees 14 lakhs now you have to ascertain that what is the cost of goods sold during the year 2010 to 11 and whether you have made a profit or a loss during the year so we have to answer two important questions from this example the first is that whether we have a profit or a loss the second is that what is the cost of goods sold in this case let us try to see the solution of this case as per the matching concept the total cost of goods available for sale is made up of goods from the previous year that is opening stock amounting to 2 lakh rupees and goods bought during the year amounting to 13 lakh 50 thousand out of the goods costing rupees 4 lakh 50 thousand are still unsold also called as the closing stock of the company the cost of goods sold can be calculated as opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock which will be equal to 11 lakh rupees with the calculation the company has earned 14 lakh rupees from sale of goods by matching the cost of goods sold against the income the profit for the year 10 to 11 will come out to 3 lakh rupees so this ascertainment of profit of 3 lakh rupees is being done with the help of the matching concept the equation written over here will help you to find out whether you have made a profit or a loss so this is the matching concept and that is how we calculate the profit or loss as per the matching concept when we moving on to the next concept which is called as accrual basis of accounting this is exactly not a concept but it is a basis of accounting which can be followed by several companies there can be two bases of accounting which may be followed which is called as one is called as cash basis one is called as accrual basis when we say cash basis cash basis means that all the transactions which will be entered into the books of accounts will be made for cash only if you have done a credit transaction that will not be capable of being entered into the books of accounts as per the cash basis of accounting but if you are following accrual basis of accounting then both the transactions cash and credit will go into the books of accounts generally the accounts are prepared as per the accrual basis of accounting let's try to understand accrual basis of accounting with an example here abc diagnostic limited has a practice of paying monthly salary on the 7th of next month accordingly the salary for the month of 2011 was paid on 7th april 2011 if the company follows cash basis of accounting when would the expenses be recognized what if the company follows accrual basis of accounting now in this example we have got two important questions to be answered number one if the company is following cash basis how will be the entry done if the company is following accrual basis how will be the entry done so answer to do to these important perspective questions can be done as follows when we talk about accrual basis of accounting and we are following cash basis suppose in cash basis of accounting expenses are recorded upon the payment only accordingly the salary paid will be recorded as an expense on 7th of april 2011 when it was actually paid and it will appear as an expense for the year 2011 to 12 but if it is following accrual basis if abc diagnostic limited follows an accrual basis of accounting expenses will be recorded when they have been incurred meaning that when a legally binding obligation to pay for it has occurred as the company has used the services of its employees it has an obligation to pay 
So that means as such the salary for the month of March has already been accrued. If they are paying it on the 7th of next month, it does not mean that the expense had not accrued. The expense had been accrued at the end of the March only. So hence as per the accrual basis of accounting, it becomes an expense on 31st of March 2011 even if the payment is made on 7th of April 2011. Accordingly, it will be recorded as an expense for the year 2010 to 11, though it is paid in 11 to 12. This is what is accrual basis of accounting differentiated from cash basis of accounting. To prepare the books of accounts, we must understand the difference between the two. The cash basis will be the recording of the transactions which are made on cash only. An expense will be recorded when it has been paid. In the accrual basis of accounting, it does not matter when it has been paid. It will be entered into the books of accounts as an expense when it becomes due for payment. This is the basic difference between cash basis of accounting and accrual basis of accounting. Moving on to the next concept which is called as dual aspect concept also has an important essence of accounting in this aspect. It is also called as double entry system in the books of accounts. When we say dual aspect concept, it means that accounting works like a weighing machine. Whatever is there on the left hand side will be equated to the right hand side, meaning that any transaction which occurs in the business anything which you put into the books of accounts will have a counter effect. For example, if you make a sale, you will produce cash from that cash sale and on the other hand, the inventory will also go out from the business. Another example could be, you purchase a furniture for your business and you make the payment through a check. In this case, bank balance will be reduced and the furniture balance will be increased. So it means that any transaction that you will try to analyze in the perspective of accounts, it will have a two-way effect called as dual aspect concept or also called as double entry system. Let's try to see an example for dual aspect concept here. A person Mr. Ramesh Jha starts a business on 1st of April 2011 contributes 10 lakh rupees in cash as a capital amount. The firm has bought some furniture for 2 lakh rupees in cash and it bought some machinery from XYZ Limited for 7 lakh rupees on credit. How would these transactions affect the accounting equation? Now as per the dual aspect concept, each transaction here in this example must have a two-way effect and it must have a bearing on the corresponding items. Let's try to see how these will go into the books of accounts. As per the dual aspect concept, when Mr. Jha has introduced 10 lakh rupees as capital, it has a dual effect on the business. How? The business has acquired an asset called as cash and it has also got an obligation to pay to Mr. Jha. Here, I would like to retreat that you can also refer to separate entity concept for better understanding of why Mr. Jha has to be paid. The second is when furniture is bought for 2 lakh rupees and it is paid in for cash. One type of asset, cash, is replaced by another type of asset called as furniture. So again, we have a two-way effect, one on the cash and second on the furniture. The third example is when the firm has bought a machinery on credit. Now what is happening here? No cash, no bank is being reduced. So how will we create the dual aspect concept here? It results in an increase in assets, that is machinery, and at the same time it has incurred a liability towards XYZ Limited. Meaning that even if the cash is not paid today, even if the payment is not made today, the obligation to pay has arisen to XYZ Limited. So because the payment has to be done in future, this will have a two-way effect. One, your machinery balance will increase. Two, your liability towards XYZ Limited for paying in the future has increased. This is called as dual aspect concept. 
Now, we move on to the next thing which is called as the conventions. So, concepts and conventions are two sides which should be simultaneously seen before you make the books of accounts. Moving on to conventions, the first important convention is called as conservatism or prudence. Conservatism or prudence refers to that this is basically working like a cushion in the books of accounts. An accountant would always like to foresee in the future what is happening and based on that only he will act. For example, Reliable Limited sells here goods on credit basis. On 31st of March 2011, it has a total outstanding amount of 120 million rupees from its customers. The past experience shows that 5% of the customers invariably will default. Now, how do we account for this anticipated loss? This principle, this convention called as conservatism or prudence acts as an edge towards this possible default from the customers. Now, how will it work? Let us try to see. As based upon the past experience, 5% loss is reasonably probable. The company will make a provision for anticipated losses for 6 million rupees. This will appear in the profit and loss statement for the year 31st of March 2011 as an expense. In the balance sheet receivables will be shown as 114 that is 114 million rupees that is the net of the provisions. This is called as concept convention of conservatism or prudence. Moving on to the next convention which is called as consistency. Consistency means that the accounts will be prepared on a consistent basis, meaning that the methodologies for preparing accounts year on year will remain the same. For example, Red Swan Auto Limited is proposing to change its accounting cycle for valuation of inventories as the management feels that it would lead to better estimation of cost of inventories. Can they do it? Let us see whether they can do it or not. Yes, Rad Swan Auto can change the accounting policy for better estimation of their cost. However, the company needs to disclose the change in its accounting policy. Why? Because the impact of this change must be quantified and disclosed to the stakeholders because the financial results may vary because of the change in this methodology. Ideally, it is suggested that a consistent method should be followed. If there is a change, it should be reported. Moving on to the next convention, it is called as full disclosure. The name itself suggests. This convention means that you should disclose all information to your stakeholders and not hide anything from them. For example, Accounting reports to disclose fully and fairly information they purport to the representatives. The convention is gaining more importance because most of the big businesses are now run by joint stock companies where ownership is different from the management. So, we should follow full disclosure concept to show that yes, we are giving all the information to our stakeholders. Another important convention is called as materiality or relevance. The name itself suggests that you should put only relevant information in the books of accounts. Unnecessarily detailed information should not go into the books of accounts. For example, in the profit and loss statement of T Limited, about 60 percent of the expenses have been clubbed under the heading miscellaneous expenses, whereas C Limited has reported all the heads of the expenses separately including about 100 different types of expenses which together constitute only 10 percent of the total expenses in rupee terms. What are your views based on these two companies? Certainly, here what has happened? In case of T Limited, the vital details are being lost, are being presented at 60 percent of the expenses and they are being clubbed as miscellaneous expenses. The company should analyze its expenses under relevant heads and disclose it properly. If 60 percent of the expenses are being shown under one head, it is not a good practice. We should give details of these 60 percent of the bifurcation. However, in case of C Limited, 
there is an over disclosing. So, we should not be giving an over disclosure of the information, we should not be giving an under disclosure of the information. We can better club a number of expenses as different heads and as miscellaneous and make the financial statements simpler to understand. So, for these two companies, one company was showing an over information, another company was showing an under information, we should try to have a balance between the two and we should present the relevant and material information only to our stakeholders. So, in this class, we had concepts and conventions discussion as well as we understood the meaning of the term gap. In the next class, we will try to understand the basic overview of Indian accounting standards as well as we will try to understand what is the difference between IFRS and Indian accounting standards. Thank you.